The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So what we've been trying to do is to develop a description of properties of some system, could be something like a gas, that uh, includes both mechanical as well as thermal properties. So the first thing that we decided to do was to wait until this system has properties that do not change further with the observation time that we are assigning to the system. And then if it is a gas, we can say, OK, the gas has some pressure and volume. In general, we said that uh, we can characterize the system through a set of uh, uh, displacements and uh, conjugate forces, which are used when we describe systems that uh, are mechanical. Work on them is done. We can say that the work is JVX, for example. Okay. Then we decided that this mechanical description was not enough because systems uh, uh, could exchange heat and gradually started to build a more general prescription that included the, the exchange of heat. We saw that, for example, from the zeroth law, we could define temperature as a function of these quantities. And uh, that uh, we could also, from the first law, define energy. And in particular, uh, that the change in energy which is a function of where you are in equilibrium. So once you say that you have a system in equilibrium, you can say what the values of the x's and j's are. You know somehow what the value of temperature is, what the value of energy is. And if you were to uh, make a change in energy by some external means, the amount of uh, change would either come from mechanical work that you did on the system or the heat that you supply to the system. Now, this expression is the one that we would like to uh, elevate somehow and be able to compute uh, energy as a function of state, kind of keeping in mind what we would do if there was no heat around and we could do things mechanically. Then mechanically, we could, in principle, build up the energy function by uh, changing displacement slightly and calculating the amount of work by this formula. Basically, we emphasized that you would be able to use a formula such as this if you were to make uh, things sufficiently slowly so that at each stage in the process, you could calculate what Ji is, which means that at each stage in the process, you should be in some kind of an equilibrium state. Okay? If that was the case, if you didn't have dq, then this would be your energy function. And actually, once you had the energy function, you could, for example, calculate j as a derivative of energy with respect to x. So then you also start to thinking, well, how many independent degrees of freedom do I have? Do I really need all of the set of x's and j's to describe my system in equilibrium if additionally, once I know the e, I can de derive all of the j's? So we have to also come eventually to grips with how many independent degrees of freedom will describe our system. Now, the first step towards completing this expression was to find what dq is. So we needed another uh, law of thermodynamics beyond zeroth law and first law that somehow related heat and temperature to each other, because we expect that somehow this expression will include temperature. And uh, what uh, we used was some version of the second law that was uh, how heat would flow from, say, a hotter body to a colder body. And Clausius's theorem would say that you have only heat flowing in one particular direction. Well, we sort of introduced the idea of engines 
which are machines that are used to do work by taking heat from the hotter body to the colder body. And uh, we could define an efficiency, which is work divided by heat input, which since work is the difference between these two, we could write as 1 minus uh, QC over QH. And then we introduced a special class of engines, which were these Carnot engines. And the idea of this class was that you could run them forward and backward. They were kind of irreversible. Uh, they were kind of uh, analog of the frictionless type of processes that you would use to construct mechanical energy. And we found that uh, these uh, engines were the most efficient. And so the efficiency of these engines was marked only by the two temperatures. So we had a functional form potentially of efficiency as a function of the two temperatures involved. And uh, what we also showed was that the efficiency of any random engine was going to be less than the efficiency of the Carnot engine that is marked by these two temperatures. And by putting some Carnot engines in series, we saw that the good way to write this was something of this form. I can, in principle, remove the 1 from the two sides of this equation and rearrange it a little bit into the form QH over TH plus minus QC over TC because of this inequality, writing it as less than or equal to 0. Okay. Okay. What does that tell us? As it stands, not much. But then I promised you at the end of last lecture that this is an example of a much more powerful result, which is the Clausius theorem. So let's start with writing what that theorem is and how it relates to this simple expression. And the theorem is that for any cyclic process, I can cyclic, what does it mean? Is that in the set of coordinates in principle that is used to describe the system, I will start with a position that is equilibrium. So I can put that point in this state. But then I make a transformation and ultimately return to that point. So the cycle is the return to that point. So I carry out a set of steps. And I haven't uh, indicated these set of steps through a connected continuous curve in this uh, multidimensional coordinate space, because I don't want to restrict myself to processes that are even in equilibrium. So I may take a gas that I have over there, expand it rapidly, close it rapidly, as long as I wait when I come back to the same point that I have reached my equilibrium again, I have done a cyclic process. Now, at each stage of this cyclic process, presumably, uh, the system takes in a certain amount of heat. So let's say that there is a BQ that goes at this stage of the process. So I use S to indicate, say, stage 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way coming back. So this is just a numbering process. The statement of Clausius' uh, theorem is that for any cyclic process, if I go around the cycle, add up these elements of heat that are delivered to the system, and I allow the possibility, therefore, that some of the times these elements dq will be negative, just as I did over here by writing this as minus qc. So that what the dq is, is what has gone into whatever this black box is. So qh went into this black box. q 
QC went out, which means that minus QC went in. So I arranged it in this fashion. You can see that the elements of heat are divided by some temperature. I generalize that expression over here by writing a T of S here. And the statement of Clausius's theorem is that this quantity has the same sign constraint as here, where I told you that dQ is heat delivered to system. at temperature T sub S. Now, this particular thing requires a certain amount of thinking about. Because I told you that your system is not in equilibrium. So what is this T sub S? If you have a system that is not in equilibrium, you can't define its temperature. However, you can imagine that whatever machine was delivering it had some particular temperature. And so that's the temperature of the device or whatever is delivering this heat to the system. And you would be justified to say, well, why, why is that even useful? Because certainly, if I were to have exactly the same cycle but deliver the heat elements, through a different process, this Ts would be different. So this is really also a function of the method through which I want to carry out this cycle. So given that, it doesn't sound like a particularly uh, useful theorem. It seems very arbitrary. So let's first prove it. The proof is simple, and then see whether it's useful or not. Any questions at this point? OK, so how do we go through uh, proving it? We are going to use these Carnot engines. So what I will imagine is that I have some big uh, bat that is at some, let's say, for purposes of uh, our use, uh, a high temperature uh, bat, bat of hot water. And I use this bat as the process that provides heat to this entity. Exactly what do I mean by that? I will use a Carnot engine to take heat, let's call it QH, although its sign is not that particularly important, and convert this into the heat element dQS that is delivered here. So since I'm using uh, S, an infinitesimal element here, let me call this dQ. And let's call it dQ0 because I'm picking it up from the temperature of T0. So I have, as a result of this process, a certain amount of work. All of this corresponds to the S element through this particular cycle. So I divide my cycle to lots of elements. Each element takes in this amount of heat. And I use a Carnot engine to deliver that heat. And uh, uh, always taking the Carnot engine from uh, the input from T0. But what it delivers is where this uh, randomness in temperature T of S comes about. Why did I use a Carnot engine? Because I said that sometimes this cycle is going to take in heat. Sometimes it is going to give out heat. So I want to be able to run this both forward and backward. Yes? Are you delivering the work to the cycle too? No. Okay. The work goes whenever it goes. Okay. okay? And indeed, that's the next step of the argument, which is where the, what, did, what happened to the work. Okay? So we do this. At the end of the story, I am back to where I started. Maybe I'm, yes? Maybe I'm missing something basic, but I don't understand why, why you can't just define the function dQ naught of s and ignore the Carnot engine. 
Like, just deliver it to the key. Like, what was wrong with just the blue arrow? OK. Why can't I just take heat from here to here? Because in principle, where I put it is at a different temperature when I eventually go to equilibrium. And then I would run into problems of second law as to the ability to transfer heat from a hotter to colder range. So if you like, this intermediate stage allows me ultimately to uh, vary this temperature Ts. What you say is correct as long as this T of S is uniformly T0. Kind of becomes useless. OK? All right, so we enclose our cycle, the Carnot engine, everything into a box. And we see what this box is doing. So there is the box. The box takes in elements of heat uh, VQ from the reservoir and does elements of work dw at different stages. Now, once the cycle has been completed, the net result is that I have extracted an amount of heat. So this is the net extracted heat, is the integral over the cycle of dq0 uh, of s and converted it to work. Oh, one other step. Uh, once I'm using the Carnot engine, and I think I emphasize this, there is a relationship between heat and temperature. Is this proportionality, QH is proportional to H for the Carnot engine, QC is proportional to TC. So uh, there is a proportionality between the heat that I take and the heat that I deliver that is related to the temperatures. So dq0 <coughs> is, in fact, t0 dq that goes into the engine divided by the temperature at which it is delivered to the engine. Okay. Now, I know also something about this, because the second law of thermodynamics says that no process is possible whose sole result is the conversion of heat to work. I can do the opposite. I can convert work to heat. But that means that the integral here has to be negative. Okay. Now, t0 is just a positive constant. So once I divide through by that, I have gotten the proof of the statement that I wanted. Okay. Questions? Yes. So how does this really then help with the definition of T of S? Because theoretically, like even your extraction of heat and your um, doing the work in that black box or the opposite could happen uh, irreversibly, right? So you exactly. still have a problem. Yeah. So as I have written it here, I would agree. It looks completely useless. Okay. So let's make it useful. I'm, am I going to make it useful? So let's start some set of uh, corollaries to this theorem. So the first thing is we get rid of this definition by considering a reversible transformation. OK? So same picture that I has, was drawing before with multiple coordinates, start some point and come back. But now I will draw a solid curve in this space meaning that at each stage of the process, I will do it sufficiently slowly so that my system comes to thermal equilibrium, and I can identify it as a point in this generalized phase space. OK? So now I have points in this generalized phase space. To each point, I can therefore assign 
the equilibrium temperature that I am at that stage of the cycle. Okay? So now I can request my Carnot engines to deliver the heat at the temperature of the system to be maintaining the whole system plus the Carnot engines at thermal equilibrium as I uh, switch from one cycle to another cycle. Okay? So now I have a relationship that is pertaining to things that are in equilibrium as long as I follow the equilibrium temperature of the system and do reversible transformations, I have the result that dq reversible over ts is less than zero. But the thing about this. Um, could you explain again why that path integral of dq is not over S6? OK. Clausius' theorem says that if I took heat from a bat and converted it to useful work, I have violated the second law. So the sign of the net amount of heat that I extract, extracted better be negative. Right? Okay. So you are not going to be able to have a bat and extract energy out of the lake and run your rack, uh, engine. It's not allowed. Okay. Now my path is reversible, which means that I could go this way, or I could go this opposite way. And if I go the opposite way, what was the definition of reversible? I reverse all of the heat exchanges, inputs and outputs. OK? Which means that what I was calling previously dq becomes minus dq. So the inequality holds for both minus or plus which means that as long as I do reversible transformations, I must have the integral to be equal to 0. OK? Good. So we constructed, in sense, the analog of doing frictionless ways of doing work and increasing the energy of the system. We have an idea about reversible ways and the relationship to t, well, one step further I need to go, which is that uh, I go from some point A to some point B in my coordinate space. Okay? I can do it multiple ways. I can go this way and then come back reversibly. I can go this way and come back one way or the other. So everywhere I have a number of choices. Essentially what it says is that I can go from, say, A to B, dq, reversible over t over some path. And the answer is going to be the same for doing it along a different path. Because if I went along this path, I can close the reversible cycle either by returning that way or by going the other way. So going this way or going that way, the result of the integration along reversible path should be the same. And it should be the same also for any other path that I take between these two points. So it kind of, again, reminds us of uh, pushing a particle up a hill. And as long as you are doing things frictionlessly, the amount of work that you do in this process does not depend on how you go there. It's just the potential energy difference between the two points. So this entity being independent of the path implies immediately that there is some function, like the potential energy, that only depends on the two endpoints. And this is how we would define the entropy. So what we have essentially said is that if I take an infinitesimal step, there is an infinitesimal amount of heat that I can do reversibly. 
that is related to the change of the state function through, let's say, ds is the q reversible over t, or vice versa, dq being t ds. OK? We've done it finally. We can get our expression. Because we have now the possibility to go from this point to this point reversibly using a reversible transformation. <coughs> and calculate the change in energy. Now, quite generally, the change in energy, conservation law, it's dw plus dq. If I do this reversible change so that at each element I'm in equilibrium, I know what j is, the dw is sum over i j i dxi. And I have established that as long as I do reversible transformations, dq is tds. And so we have this formula. Okay. So I will write that again because really this is the most important relationship that you need to know from thermodynamics. And you have to put all kinds of colorful things around it so you remember. Okay. Now in particular there is a very common misconception, which is that results are relevant to transformations. And you derive this result for a reversible transformation. So this formula is only valid for reversible transformation. No, that's not the case. It is like saying I calculated the potential energy of pushing something up the hill through a frictionless process. Therefore, the potential energy is only relevant for frictionless transformations. No. Potential energy exists. It's a function of states. Energy is a function of state. And we have been able to relate energy as a function of state to all the other equilibrium quantities that we have over here. OK? Any questions? OK. So now we can answer. Another side question that I raised at the beginning, which is I started with xi and ji as describing the system in equilibrium. Then I gradually added t, I added e, now I've added s. How many things do I need to describe the system in equilibrium? A lot of these are dependent on each other. And in particular, we saw that mechanically, if there was the only thing that was happening in the story, the j's could be obtained from the derivatives of energy with respect to x. So j's, in some sense, once you had e, were given to you. You didn't have to list all of the j's. You just needed to uh, add e as a function of x's. But when you have thermal transformations around, that's not enough. This equation says that if there are n ways of doing work on the system, there is one way of doing heat, you have n plus 1 independent degrees of freedom. So n ways of sum over i, j, i, d, x, i, one way of s, d, t, you have n plus 1 independent variables to describe your system. And once you realize that, you have a certain amount of freedom in choosing precisely which n plus 1 you want to select. So I, I could select uh, all of the x's and one temperature. I could select all of the j's and one energy. So I have a number of choices. And once I have made my choice, I can rearrange things accordingly. So suppose I had chosen the energy and xi, then I could write ds to be dE over t 
minus sum over i j i over t x i. So I just rearrange this expression and solve for ds. So this amounts to my having chosen x's and e's as independent variables and prescribed through this uh, important law, s as a function of e and x's. What about everything else? Well, everything else you can calculate by derivatives. So 1 over t would be ds by dE at constant x, while ji over t would be minus ds by dxi at constant uh, e and uh, xj that is not equal to i. Fine, so that sort of uh, kind of extracts the uh, mathematical content that we can get out of the second law through this Clausius's theorem. There is one important uh, corollary that has to do with irreversible uh, transformations. After all, in setting off the Clausius's theorem, I did not say anything about the necessity of being in equilibrium in order to achieve the inequality. Reversibility allowed me to get it as an equality. So what can I do? I can take any complicated space. I can pick a point A, and in principle, make an irreversible transformation to some point B. And maybe in that process, I will get some heat input to the system, dQ. And uh, what I would have is that the integral going from A to B, dQ, uh, divided by T along the hat that I have described here, which is irreversible. Well, I can't say anything about it at this point. Clausius's theorem has to do with cycles. So I can, in principle, connect back from B to A reversibly. So I go integral from B to A, dQ reversible over T. And having completed the cycle, I know for the cycle that this is negative. If I were to take this to the other side of the equation, it becomes essentially the difference of uh, the entropies. Or here, it's also the difference of entropies. But I prefer it to be on the other side. And then to make these two points very close to each other, in which case, I can write that dq is less than or equal to t ds. This is the change in entropy in going from a to b. Okay. Again, there's some question here as to what this t is. So let's get rid of that uncertainty by looking at processes that are adiabatic. So I make sure that there is no heat exchange in going from A to B. What do I conclude then? Is that for these processes, the change in entropy has to be positive. Okay? Because T's are generally positive quantities. Okay? So a consequence of uh, Clausius's theorem is that entropy can only increase in any transformation. It is change in entropy would be 0 for these adiabatic transformations if we have uh, uh, reversible processes. 
So this is actually another one of those statements that you have to think a little bit to see whether it has any use or not. Because we all say that entropy has to increase. But is that what we have proven here? Not quite. Because what we have proven is that if you have a system that is isolated, so there is a system that is isolated because I want dq to be 0, and I want entropy to increase. OK? So let's say we start with some initial condition, and we wait and go to some final condition of whatever is inside the box. I should be able to calculate entropy before and after in order to see that this change is positive. OK, but we say entropy is a function of state. And what have I done here to change the state? So how can I say that there is any entropy? I cannot calculate entropy if the system is not in equilibrium. If the system is in equilibrium, it presumably does not change as a function of time. So what is this expression relevant to? The expression is relevant to when you have some kind of a constraint that you remove. So imagine that, let's say, there is a, a gas in this room and some kind of a piston that is initially clamped to some position. Then I can calculate the entropy of what's on the left side, what's on the right hand side, and that would be my initial entropy. I remove the clamp, I remove the constraint, so this can slide back and forth, and eventually it comes to another position. So then I can again calculate the final entropy from the sum of what's on the left side and what's on the right hand side. And I can see that entropy is increased. So basically, this statement really is useful when there is some internal constraint that you can remove. And as you remove the internal constraint, the entropy increases. So I guess the image that we all have is that if I give you two pictures of a room one with books uh, nicely arranged on the shelf, and one with books randomly distributed, you would have no problem to time order them. And actually, presumably, there was some constraint from the shelf that was removed, and then these things uh, fell down. So that's the kind of process for which this statement of the second law is appropriate. Any questions? OK. So that statement is something about approach to equilibrium. That is, I said that there was some initial configuration with some constraint. And as a function of uh, uh, removing that constraint, the system would go from one sort of equilibrium, constrained equilibrium, to an unconstrained equilibrium. And this. Uh, increase of entropy tells us in which direction it would go. You can time order the various processes. Now, sometimes this adiabatic way of doing things is not the best way. And so depending on what it is that you are looking at, rather than looking at entropy, you will be looking at different uh, functions. And so the next step is to construct different types of functions that are useful for telling us something about equilibrium. Now I'll start doing that by some function with which you are very familiar and uh, has practically nothing to do with uh, entropy and temperature. So we are going to look at mechanical equilibrium. And so the kind of prototype of this, since we've been thinking in terms of uh, uh, springs or wires, is let's imagine that I have a wire that has some natural length. And it is sitting there happily in equilibrium. And then I attach, let's say, a mass to it. And because of that, I'm pulling it with a force that I will indicate by j. So j, if you are in gravity, would be mass of this times j. Okay. Now, if you were doing things in vacuum, 
what would be happen to your uh, uh, x, which is the distortion that you would have from the equilibrium as a function of time. What would happen is presumably the thing would start to oscillate, and you would get something like this. That's certainly not equilibrium. But in real world, there is always friction that is operating. And so if there is a lot of friction, what is going to happen is that your x will come to some final value. So again, this is a constraint, which I allowed this to move. And because of that constraint, I went from the initial equilibrium that corresponded to x equals to 0 to some final equilibrium. And you say, well, if I want to calculate that final equilibrium, what I need to do is to remove all of the kinetic energy so that the thing does not move anymore, which means that I have to minimize the potential energy. I'll give it the symbol h for reasons to become apparent shortly. And that uh, is the sum of the energy that I have in the spring. Let's imagine that it is a Hookean spring. You would have a formula such as this, plus the potential energy that I have in my mass, which is related to how far I go up and down. And so an appropriate description is minus Jx. Okay, so this is the net potential energy of the spring plus whatever is supplying the mass that is supplying the external force. And so in this case, what you have is that minimizing H with respect to the constraint X will give you that the X equilibrium is J over K. Okay, so basically, it comes down to j over k. Okay? And that the value of this function, potential energy function in equilibrium, substituting this over here, is minus j squared over k, 2k. Okay? So in many processes, that involve thermodynamics, we are going to do essentially the same thing. And we are going to call this net potential energy, in fact, an enthalpy. Okay. And the generalized version of what I wrote down for you is the following. In the process that I described, which was related to the increase in entropy, we were dealing with a system that was isolated. Uh, dq was 0. And there was no work because the coordinates were not changing. dw was 0. Whereas here, I'm looking at a process where there is a certain amount of work because uh, this external j that I'm putting is doing work on the spring. It is adding uh, energy to the spring. And the thing is that uh, because of the friction, it doesn't continue to oscillate. So some of the energy that I would have put in the system if I really were using the formula ji dxi is lost somehow. You can see those oscillations have gone away. Now. I'm always doing this process at constant j, right? So if I prescribe for you some path of x as a function of t, j dx is the same thing as d of jx, because j does not change. x changes. Okay. I'm going to also Imagine processes where mechanical equilibrium, but uh, with no heat, so that dq is 0. If I were to add these two together, then I will get an inequality involving dE which is less than or equal to d of j i x i, which I can write as 
the change in E minus Ji Xi has to be negative. So appropriate to processes which are conducted so that there is mechanical work at constant force is this function that is usually called H for enthalpy. And what we find is that the H is going to be negative. And again, if you think about it, this is precisely this enthalpy is none other than the potential energy that is in the mechanical degrees of freedom. And there is always loss in the universe. And so the uh, direction naturally is for this uh, potential energy to decrease. One thing to note is that the H is the E. Thinking of it not now as a process going on at constant j, but as a change in a function of state. Because we said that once I prescribe where I am in the coordinate space, I know what, say, E is. I know what j is. I can certainly construct a function, which is E minus jx. It's another function of state. And I can ask what happens if I make a change from one point in space to another point. Along the path that potentially allows variations in j, the E I know is j i dx i. Uh, and then, actually, I'm using summation conversion. So let's remove that, plus T dS. And here, it becomes minus Ji dXi minus Xi dJi. Ji dXi is cancel. And we have that if I construct a function H as E minus Jx, the natural variations of it are TDS, just like the E, but rather than X dJ, I have, sorry, rather than J dX, I have minus X dJ. Okay. So H is naturally expressed as a function of variables that are S and the Ji's. And remember that we said we are doing things at constant j. So it's nice that it happens that way. And in particular, if I do partial derivatives, I find that my xi is minus the h by the ji at constant s. So that in the same way before, I said that if you have the energy function, the e by dx would give you j. If you have the h functions, the h by dj would give you x. <coughs> Let's check. Here we had an h function. If I do a dh by dj with a minus sign, what do I get? I will get j over k. What was my equilibrium x? It was j over k. OK? Now, both of these functions that we have encountered so far for expressing the system, energy or enthalpy, have as their argument entropy. Now, if I give you a box, you will have a hard time potentially figuring out what entropy is. But varying temperature is something that we do all the time. So it would be great if we could start expressing things not in terms of entropy, in terms of anything else. Well, what's the natural thing if not entropy? Here we went from x to the conjugate variable j. I can make a transformation that goes from uh, s to the uh, conjugate uh, variable, which is temperature. And that would be relevant, therefore, when I'm thinking about isothermal processes. And so what I'm going to do is to reverse the role of the two elements of energy that I had previously for mechanical energy, um, for mechanical processes. 
So what we had there was that dq was 0, but I want dq to be non-zero. What we had there was that dw was non-zero. So let's figure out processes where dw is 0. But dq, the same way that previously we were doing dw at constant j, let's do dq not equals to 0 at constant t. And constant t is where the isothermal expression comes into play. Okay. So if dw is 0, I have a natural inequality that involves dq. I just erased it, I think. Yeah, it's not here. dq is less than or equal to t ds. And if t is a constant throughout the process, I can write this as d of ts. Add these two together to get that de less than or equal to t, d of ts. Or tracking it to the other side, I can define a function, which is the Helmholtz free energy. f, which is e minus ts. And what we have is that the natural direction of flow for free energy, when we remove some kind of a constraint at constant temperature, is that we will tend to minimize the free energy. And then again, doing the manipulation of df is dE minus d of ts in general, will have minus TDS minus SDT. The TDS part of DE will vanish. And what I will have is JI DXI uh, minus SDT. So now we can see that finally for the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy, the natural variable rather than being entropy is the temperature and all set of displacements. And then if you ask, well, what happened to the entropy? You say, well, I can get the entropy as minus df by dt at constant x. If I take this picture of the gas that I had put at the beginning, which was just erased, picture of a piston that can slide, and I think of that as a box that I bring into this room, well, then it will quickly adjust to the temperature of the room as well as the pressure of the room. So this is going to be a general transformation in which both heat and uh, work are exchanged. It is at external temperature and pressure that is fixed. So it's a transformation that is isothermal and uh, uh, constant J. In pressure, you would call it isobaric. Okay. And then quite generally, you would say, extending what we had before, in this case, dq is again less than TDS because of Clausius. DW is less than JDX because you always lose something to free energy. And sorry, some, something to friction. You always lose something to friction. You add the two things together, and you get that DE is less than or equal to TDS plus ji dxi. For the transformations that we are considering that are at constant t and j, I can take these expressions to mean the same thing as d of ts plus ji xi. 
which means that more generally I can define a function which is the Gibbs free energy G which is the energy minus Ts, this part is the Helmholtz free energy, minus Ji Xi. And that if I regard this as a function of state, which certainly will be minimized under con conditions of constant uh, j and t, if there is some constraint that is removed, quite generally as a state function, depending on all of these variables, its variations would be able to be expressed as minus s dt minus j i dx i, i.e. our g is naturally a function of temperature and the set of displacements. OK, I don't think music was appropriate at this point. I would have put it earlier, but such is life. Uh, OK, now there is something that I kind of uh, did not uh, pay sufficient, uh, yes. I did very, uh, I did, I wrote it wrong here. So maybe that's what the music was for. <laughs> okay, is it fine? Right. Anything else? Okay, the thing that I wasn't sufficiently careful with was the list of things that goes into mechanical work. Uh, and one additional care that one needs to, uh, to, to have, which is that suppose I were to tell you, uh, let's say, the pressure and temperature as my two variables. And I guess this is what I would have here if I go and uh, look at uh, pressure as my force, then have I told you everything that I need to know about the system? So I have a box, let's say, in this room that is at the pressure of this room and at the temperature of this room. Have I completely specified the box? What have I left? <coughs> How big is it? Yes. So. What I have left, I mean, I, previously maybe I had volume, but I sort of discarded the volume in terms of the pressure. Uh, so what I really need is to have the number of particles. I have to specify something, maybe the mass, something that has still is going to distinguish these boxes in terms of their size. Now, it is most useful to think in terms of the number of particles. So I give you a box. And I can say that within this box, I have so many molecules of oxygen and nitrogen or whatever is the composition. But then we sort of start to get into the realm of chemistry and the fact that uh, the different chemical components can start to uh, react with each other. Maybe even if you have a box that is uh, one component, some of the molecules are going to get absorbed on the surface. So precisely what the number is, is potentially something that is a variable. And in order to specify exactly what the energy content of a system is, you have to specify how many particles and the energy carried by those particles. So the list of things that appears here, especially when you think in terms of uh, uh, chemical systems has an additional element that is typically called chemical work. And so let's separate mechanical work from the chemical work. So mechanical work was sum over i, j, i, dx, i, where these were real displacements and 
we can actually write an expression that is very similar here, where the displacements are the number of particles of different species, allowing potentially their uh, going to other species through chemical reactions, provided we multiply these by some appropriate uh, chemical potential. So these mu's are a chemical potential. So for the reason that I stated before, that if I were to just uh, this, this ambiguity that I had about the size of the box tells me that I should have at least one thing left in my system describing the variables that is proportional to the size of the system. So typically what you do when you construct a Gibbs free energy is that you subtract the mechanical work, but you don't subtract the chemical work. So the ends will remain and can tell you how big your system is. Okay. Now there is a conjugate way. I can certainly do the other way. So here I constructed something in which mechanical work was removed, but chemical work remained. I could do it the other way around. I can define a function that is obtained by subtracting from the energy the chemical uh, work, but leaving the uh, mechanical component aside. For this function, dg, uh, OK, I should go one step uh, before. So once we separate out the contributions of ji dxi into mechanical and chemical components, I would write the E as TDS plus sum over I J I D X I plus sum over alpha mu alpha D N alpha. Okay? It's just explicitly separating out those two sources of work. Now, when I construct a G which subtracts from E the mu but not the J, what happens? I will get a minus TDS. This will remain unchanged. This will get transformed to n alpha d mu alpha. Just hold on a second. So this entity that is called the grand potential actually completes the list of these functions of state that I wanted to tell you is naturally a function of s, the chemical. Uh, Oops, minus s dt is naturally a function of t, the chemical potentials, as well as the displacement. Like, for example, if it's a gas, the displacements would include the volume, which tell you how much material you have. Yes? In that case, you need to subtract an additional t, or ts from e and the outside. Very good. These, these are all examples of free energies so that you, you define them as a function of temperature rather than entropy. The only things that really remain, the one function that you sort of keep as a function of uh, entropy is energy itself. Enthalpy, not that. Well, enthalpy too, yes. It has its uses. Yes? Okay. Uh, bring up. Right. Uh, right now, I wanted to ask you say that so a particle is added to the system, a particle of some species, um, and this is going to change the energy of mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. So, my question is well, this particle can bring energy in several ways, like um, kinetic energy, or yes. maybe it's this chemical bound that is being broken. Yes. Bring there. Absolutely. Or also it's rest energy from special relativity. Yes. So which ones are we counting? Which ones are we not counting? OK. So what you will see is that when we do all of these calculations, 
we definitely need to include, uh, when we are talking about the gas, the kinetic energy component. The, the change in the covalent bond energy definitely has to be there if I take a, an oxygen and separ a molecule and separate it to two oxygen atoms. There is that change in the energy that has to be included, corresponding uh, uh, kinetic energies. Typically, the rest mass is not included. And so if I were to include that, it will be a shift of chemical potential by an amount that is mc squared. Why do people not bother? Because typically what we will be trying to look at is the change when something happens. And you have to bring those particles presumably from somewhere. So uh, as long as you bring in particles from somewhere, then there's the difference between the rest mass that you had outside and the rest mass that you have here. That's zero. It's really all of the other things that, con uh, that contribute to useful quantities that you would be involved with, like uh, uh, temperature, pressure, et cetera. The rest mass is irrelevant. Now, I can't rule out that you will come up with some uh, process that is going on in a white dwarf or whatever, where the rest mass is an important contribution. So it may, to some extent, look uh, depend on the circumstance that you are looking at. It, but if you are asking truly what should I include in the chemical uh, potential? It will include the rest of us. So for example, in, I, I don't know, in, in, in cosmology, they often talk of, of uh, the chemical potential of the different species, like elementary particles you know, in the cosmos. And right. they, they say that the chemical potential of photons is zero. Yes. So here they have fixed some kind of convention. No. You see, there is a difference between photons and other particles, such as uh, electrons or whatever, which is that you have baryon number or some other uh, number conservation that is applicable. So any process that you have will, fix, uh, will not change the number of baryons. Whereas uh, there are processes in which there is uh, something that is heated and will give you whatever number of photons that you wish. So there is a distinction between things that are conserved and things that are not conserved. So uh, we will get to that maybe later on as to why it is appropriate for, to set chemical potential to zero for non-conserved uh, non things. OK? Yeah, but it's uh, certainly something that uh, we have immediately a feel for what the pressure is, for uh, what uh, uh, the temperature is. So we have our senses seem to sort of tell you the reality of uh, uh, temperature and chemical potential and, pr uh, sorry, temperature and pressure, and, but uh, maybe not so much the chemical potential. So I tried to see whether we have a sense that actually uh, is sensitive to chemical potential, and we do to some extent is you drink something and you say it's too salty or whatever, so somehow you are measuring the chemical potential of salts. So if you like, that's, that would be your sensual equivalent of chemical potential. OK? Yes? Is there like a potential where you have both chemical and mechanical work? OK, so that will run into the problem of if I do that, then my parameter is going to be T, J, and mu. And then I can ask you, how, may, how much do I have? Because all of these quantities are intensive, right? So it could be a box that is one cubic centimeters or miles long. So I'm not allowed to do that. And there is a mathematical reason for that that I was going to come to shortly. Other questions? OK. So we are going to take an interlude. Actually, the last question is quite relevant to what we are going to do next, which is that we have these functions defined, et cetera, many coordinates. And one of the things that thermodynamics allows you to do is to relate measurements of one set of quantities, another set of quantities, 
and it does so through developing uh, mathematical relationships that you can have between these different functions of state. So the next segment has to do with uh, uh, mathematical results, which I will subdivide into two sets of statements. One set of statements follow from the discussion that we have had so far, which has to do with extensivity. What do I mean? Let's take a look at our most fundamental expression, which is dE is TdS plus sum over i j dxi plus uh, sum over alpha mu alpha dn alpha. Now, you recognize that certainly as the amount of material gets increased, the number of particles increases, the typical sizes and displacements get bigger, the energy content gets bigger, the entropy content is related to the heat content, and so that gets bigger. So these uh, differential forms that I have on, the, uh, on this uh, expression, they're all proportional to the size of the system. What does that mean? It means that E, the way that I have it here, has as its natural variables S, X, N. And extensivity means that if I were to make my system twice as large so that all of these quantities would get multiplied by a factor of 2, the energy content would get multiplied by a factor of 2. Now it is important to state that this is not a requirement, okay? This is a statement about most things that we encounter around us, but once you go, let's say, to the cosmos and you have a star, the gravitational energy of the star is not proportional to its volume, it goes like, the size to some fractional power, et cetera. So that is an example of a system because of the way gravity works as a long range force that it is not extensive system. Typically, this would work as long as you have interactions among your elements that are sufficiently short ranged so that uh, you don't get non-extensivity. If that's the case, then I can take a derivative of uh, this expression with respect to lambda, evaluate it at lambda equals to uh, 1. If I take a derivative with respect to lambda here, I will have dE by dS uh, times uh, S. I mean, the argument here is lambda S. I'm taking a derivative with respect to the first argument. So I bring out a factor of S, dE by dS at constant x and n. And then the next term is xi dE with respect to all the different xi's at constant s and n. The next one is going to be n alpha dE by uh, dn alpha at constant x and s. And there's only one lambda on this side, which is going to give me E of s x. Now, if I look at my initial expression, I can immediately see that dE by dS at constant x and n is none other than t. So this is the same thing as t. dE by dxi at constant s and n is none other than ji. dE by dn alpha at constant x and J, uh, s is none other than mu alpha. So once I set the argument to be 1, so that all of these things are evaluated at lambda equals to 1, I have the result that E is equal to Ts plus Ji xi plus mu alpha and alpha. So in some sense, all I did was I took the 
more fundamental expression and removed all of the Ds. So some places this is called the fundamental relation, but I don't like that because it is uh, uh, only valid for systems that are extensive, whereas the initial formula is valid irrespective of that. Okay. Now, once I have this, what I can do is I can take uh, think of this as a relationship among different functions of state, take a derivative and write it as dE is d of ts. d of ts is t ds plus s dt plus d of ji xi, which gives me ji dxi plus xi dji plus d of mu alpha n alpha will give me mu alpha d n alpha plus n alpha d mu alpha. Okay, so this is just a rewriting of this expression in differential form. But I know that dE is the same thing as tds plus jdx plus mu d and alpha. So immediately what it tells me is that the intensive variables t, j, and mu are constrained to satisfy this relation which is called the Gibbs Duhan. Relation. Okay. So this is if you like the mathematical reason for my answer before that I cannot choose this set of variables to describe my system because these set of variables are not independent. If I vary two of them, the variation of the other one is fixed. And I said I need n plus 1 independent degrees of freedom. If I choose all of the intensive ones, I'm really using one additional uh, relationship that uh, relates them, makes them dependent. And of course, this also goes to the fact that I won't know what the size of the system is, both of them reflections of extensivity. Just as an example, uh, let's see chemical potential along isotherm. Um, so for a gas, what would I have? I would write SDT minus PDV minus VDP. That is my uh, contribution from the work here, remembering that uh, hydrostatic work had the wrong sign. And then I have n d mu equals to 0. I said, how do things vary along an isotherm? Isotherm means that I have to set dt equals to 0. If I'm along an isotherm, then I have that d mu is uh, rearranging things a little bit, v over n dp. So this is the formula that I would have to use. Now let's specialize to the case of an ideal gas. So I'm going to use here an ideal gas. For the case of the ideal gas, we had the relationship that PV was nKT. So V over n is the same thing as KT over P. Remember that we are dealing with an isotherm, so T is constant. dp over p I can integrate and therefore conclude that mu at an, a, a constant uh, along an isotherm as a function of the other two intensive variables, T and P, is uh, some <coughs> reference that comes from a constant of integration. And then I have KT. Integral of dp over p is log of p, d 
divided by some. Uh, actually, I can. I already put the constant here. Okay. Very briefly, to be expanded upon next lecture, uh, the other set of mathematical relations go under the name of Maxwell relations. And they follow from the following observation. If I have a function of more than one variable, let's say f of x and y, two variables, then uh, the natural way to write this consistent with what we had before is that df is df by dx partial at constant y dx plus df by dy at constant x dy. But one thing that we know from calculus is that these are first derivatives, and there are a bunch of second derivatives. In particular, the second derivative, d2f dx dy, is independent of the order of taking the derivatives, which means that if I take a derivative of this object with respect to y, I will get the same thing if I were to take the derivative of the second object with respect to x. So in particular, if I go back to my fundamental equation, VE, let's forget about the chemical potential because time is running short, Ji dxi uh, plus Tds. I identify T and Ji as the first derivatives. That is, Ji is the first derivative of E with respect to xi at constant s. T is the first derivative of E with respect to S at constant x. Then if I were to take a second derivative to construct D2E with respect to x and T and S, I could do it two ways. I, could, I already have a derivative with respect to x that gave me Ji. So I take another derivative of J with respect to S now at constant x. Or I can take a derivative here, which is dt by uh, dxi at constant s. And depending on which one of the many uh, functions of state that we introduced, e, f, g, h, you can certainly make corresponding second derivative inequalities. And the key to sort of understanding all of them is this equality of second derivatives. So what I will start next time around is to just give you a set of uh, things on the left-hand side, the analog of this. So for example, I could choose ds by dxi at constant t, and show that just by looking at the form of this, how we will be able to construct what this thing is related through a Maxwell uh, construction. Okay, thank you.